Hi, I'm Sharon Long from Stanford University. I'm here today to tell you about some remarkable organisms, two kinds of organisms, in fact, bacteria and plants. Together, they can do something that neither can do alone. They can bring nitrogen in its molecular form, which is usually very inert. They can bring that nitrogen into a chemically combined form that can be used for protein nutrition. So I'll have three topics overall. First, I'd like to give you um, uh, an introduction to the nitrogen-fixing symbiosis, in particular between rhizobium and legumes. I'd then like to focus in my second segment on the bacterial genes that are used for the um, response to the plant and for the bacteria to be able to provoke the plant in order to make the home for the bacteria once they invade. And in the final segment, I'd like to tell you some of our new research on how the plant responds to the signals that come from the bacteria. So now, in the first segment, as I mentioned, we have an overview. I'm going to tell you about something called root nodules and how these root nodules form and how they work. To get us started, I'd like to address a subject near and dear to all our hearts, and that is food. When we think about food, we're aware of the need for balance. We need carbohydrates, fats, proteins. And proteins, it turns out, are um, a particular issue in nutrition because proteins, unlike carbohydrates and fats for the most part, require a great deal of nitrogen, and nitrogen is scarce. That means that protein malnutrition, the inability to get enough protein, can happen whenever agriculture is deficient or when yields are low, and it's one of the most devastating problems for human health worldwide. So in Western cultures, when we think about getting protein, we may think, well, I need to have a protein-rich food, something which we're going to remember has a lot of nitrogen. We're going to think about, for example, some poultry. And here they are, uh, poultry, a very protein-rich food. Now, we're thinking about the theme of nitrogen. It's a critical element. Where do these animals get their nitrogen so that they can make protein? They get it from plants. And uh, ultimately, of course, whether we eat meat or eat plants, all human protein ultimately comes from plants. So that raises the question, where do the plants get their nitrogen? And the answer is they get it from the soil. Soils include compounds such as nitrates. They will include organic nitrogen, which might be um, provided from manure or decomposition of plant matter. And the plants will take up this nitrogen. They will synthesize amino acids from the soil nitrogen. And from those, they make proteins. And then we, in turn, can get our protein from those plants. However, if a field is used over and over again, ultimately it becomes depleted for nitrogen. And that means that this infertile soil is not able to support plant yield or plant nitrogen. Now, how do we overcome that? At large scales of agriculture, when fields are used uh, quite often, then um, the soil can be restored by applications of uh, nitrogen fertilizer. It's usually in the form of ammonium. Now, ammonium, remarkably, can actually be made from molecular nitrogen, which is in the air, which is very abundant, as you may know. It's the vast majority of, of the atmosphere is made of nitrogen, but it's incredibly inert. It won't combine with anything, these triple bond nitrogen. So in order to coax that nitrogen into a combined form of ammonium, there's a process called the Haber-Bosch process, which um, is able to take molecular nitrogen, con uh, combine it with hydrogen gas at very high temperature, very high pressure with a metal catalyst, and convert it to ammonium. That ammonium can then be applied on a field. The plants will take up the ammonium, they will make protein, and uh, the, the yield is therefore supported. But the problem is this. How do we get high temperature and pressure? It's by using fossil fuels. It's mostly natural gas, um, but other fossil fuels can be used, and we're all aware of the scarcity and the price of fossil fuels and uh, what lies in the future for their availability. That means that we can't necessarily depend on uh, unlimited uh, supplies of this kind of ammonium fertilizer. Are there alternatives? And it turns out for millennia, farmers in every continent of the world have known of another way. 
That is, the use of legumes, a very uh, special group of plants. It's a plant family, the leguminosae, also called Fabaceae, the third largest family in the angiosperms, or flowering plants. Legumes have this remarkable property that they can associate with bacteria from the soil. They can uh, grow a new organ called a root nodule. The bacteria live inside the root nodule. And once the bacteria are there, the bacteria are converting nitrogen into ammonia through an enzyme. This is still energy intensive. As um, biochemists, we would uh, see that it uses highly reduced electrons and a lot of ATP. But where is that coming from? It's coming from sunlight. So the advantage of this is that we're able to nourish plants and those plants then, in turn, can nourish the soil in a process that uses a biological catalyst at room temperature, at ordinary pressure, and um, uses sunlight to drive it. Now, um, as I mentioned, farmers uh, throughout the ancient world knew about this. They didn't know why it happened, but they could see that um, the use of legumes in agriculture to rotate or to use as a green manure would assure the fertility of their soils. In the New World, farmers used uh, the common bean, which is a New World plant. In the Mediterranean, they used uh, lupins. In China, they used soybean. And uh, in uh, South Asia and Africa, the cowpea. So again, throughout the world, crop rotation has been used as a, a key element of sustainable agriculture. So from that uh, view of real nodules, I'd like to draw back just a moment for a cartoon so that I can describe this in a more simplified way. We know that we're talking about legumes and the way in which they form a symbiosis with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And one of the key elements of this is that it's able to be used to replace nitrogen fertilizer. How does this happen? So, in a um, schematic form, we can imagine that there are these bacteria, the rhizobium bacteria, that grow in the soil. They're able to grow slowly as saprophytes, just scavenging uh, nutrients from the soil. And here's a plant, which again could grow if there's fertilizer, but in the absence, it's going to have a hard time. So if we've got the right bacteria and plant, and I'm going to talk about that specificity again in a few minutes, they interact to form these. What's shown here in red are root nodules, specialized organs that grow on the root within which the bacteria are um, able to fix nitrogen. So, this is where it's all happening. I love this. These are nodules. They're growing on a soybean plant. So you can see some of the nodules here, the, um, the growths that are occurring on the root. The plant is up there, and the nodules once they fix nitrogen and make uh, amino acids, that, um, the plant is able to take those amino acids, put it up in the chute where it can make uh, chlorophyll, where it can make proteins, and it's able, and ultimately, to make high protein seeds. Now, I'd like to make several points about this. First, the bacteria in these nodules are fixing nitrogen, but even that is energy intensive. And, as I've mentioned, Ultimately, it's sunlight through photosynthesis that allows the plant to support this energy-intensive process of nitrogen fixation. It's occurring only in the root nodules. It doesn't occur anywhere else in the plant. This association is highly specific, and I'll show you that in a moment with a table. It's also established through a complex developmental process, and I'll show you some microsco mi microscopic views of that. And remarkably, this uh, this process is restricted, with one known exception only in the world. It's restricted to one family, the legume family. We, we know a little bit about why that occurs, but there's a lot left to find out. The legumes I've mentioned are part of the uh, large family, which includes both agriculturally important and environmentally important species. When we think of high protein plants, many of the plants that come to mind are in fact the legumes. Um, in um, the, uh, both in terms of their seed content and in terms of the content of their leaves. We're uh, familiar with uh, soybean, 
uh, cowpea, common bean, all being high protein uh, seeds. The pea, again, a high protein seeds. Also alfalfa, which is used as a forage for animals. It has very high protein leaves. That's why it's so nourishing for animals, such as cattle and horses. But beyond the, uh, the uses for human nutrition, these plants are very important in many natural ecosystems throughout the world. We might think, for example, of this uh, acacia growing up in the African plain, or we could think of this um, mesquite tree. Let me show you this one uh, over here. And here, uh, a broom plant, a shrub. These legume shrubs and trees often grow in relatively harsh environments where they provide nutrition for the soil that's around them. So coming back to the uh, developmental process, what we want to know is how is it that those incredibly diverse groups of plants are able to establish um, this association with rhizobium, and why don't other plants do it? So I'd now like to tell you a little bit about the specificity. The, um, beyond the specificity for the legume family, Within that very diverse family, specific legume uh, types, such as the soybean, are nodulated not by just any old uh, bacterium, but only by certain restricted groups. So here we're looking at the soybean, and here I'm showing you two different species that are known to form symbiotic root nodules on soybean. Here we have the pea. It's a legume also, but its nodulating bacterium is a different one, Rhizobium leguminoserum. I'll have occasion to mention P and Rhizobium leguminoserum in the second half of my introduction. Here we have a lotus plant called uh, trefoil, and it's nodulated by a different genus, Mesorhizobium, species loti, and the system that I study, which is the genus Metacago, which includes alfalfa, and which is nodulated by Cynorhizobium melolodi. This is the species you'll hear about in terms of the direct experiments that I described through the rest of my talk with, with the one comparison that I've mentioned earlier. Now, I've told you that uh, nodule development is complex, but I haven't really shown you what I mean, and so that's what we want to do next. Um, in looking at this, um, the primary approach that I'll tell you is through microscopy. But embedded in that microscopy, I'll also tell you a little bit about the physiology. So one of the first changes that occurs in, when rhizobium meet a plant is that the root hairs, which are ordinarily straight, and here's an example of a fairly normal looking root hair right here. Instead, root hairs grow in a way that's deformed. Now, don't think of this as root hairs curling. Plant cells don't curve. Think of a plant cell as a balloon inflated really hard inside a box. Plant cells don't curl, but they can grow so that they form a curl, and that's what happens here. If you take a look at this root hair, instead of growing straight, it's grown so that it tops over and makes what's called a shepherd's crook or crozier. In that, you can see a bacterial invasion, which is called an infection thread. And that's shown here, this highly refractile line going down through the, uh, in, through the root hair. Now, at the same time that invasion is occurring on the outside, early events are also occurring inside the plant root. So I want you to imagine that the plant root is going out this way. Now here we have an uninfected plant root. It's, typical plant root cells. You can see that they're very long. They're, they look empty. That's because they're mostly filled with vacuoles, uh, a, a large vacuole. Plant root cells in the cortex here have one main job. That is to transport and transport and transport water, ions, nutrients, and so forth. That's what these cells do. They don't divide. But if the correct rhizobium and this is an example of something that happens only if you have the right species of bacterium and plant. If the correct rhizobium um, is infected onto that plant, you get this. You can see the mitotic figures happening here. The cells in the inner cortex of the root have begun to divide. They're going to form what's called a primordium. Those cells continue dividing, and the infection that started with an infection thread continues all the way through into these newly dividing cells. Here you can see a cell 
that's uh, just starting to divide. And what happens is that um, if you can follow this arrow, you can see right here there is a little uh, membrane bound, kind of an empty looking vacuole, and within it uh, a peach colored oblong. That is a single rhizobium bacterium that's being taken up into the host cell and it's being engulfed by plant plasma membrane that's going to differentiate and uh, provide a special compartment that the rhizobium will be in at, uh, when it starts to fix nitrogen. So the bacteria at this point are released from the infection thread and they're bound in plant membrane sacs. But that doesn't do justice to what's going on. This bacterium is part of a more elaborate compartment and I'm showing that compartment here. This, shown in orange, is the bacterium. But you see there's an extra boundary. There's not just the bacterial membrane, but there's another membrane. That's referred to as the symbiosome membrane. It's derived from the plant plasma membrane that was used to engulf the bacterium when it first entered the host cell. But at this point, it's become a distinctive compartment with its own protein trafficking signals. I'll just tell you a little bit about the basics of transport. Of course, this is the real action. We have nitrogen converted enzymatically into ammonium. This uses ATP and highly reduced electrons. And that ammonium is in turn transported out to the plant. As I've mentioned before, the bacterium gets energy from the plant. Malate and other dicarboxylic acids are transported into the bacterium. From there, they enter into the bacteria's own metabolism. So plant photosynthate, providing energy, bacterial nitrogen fixation, providing ammonium, that had been suspected for a long time. But emerging data from a number of labs shows that there's more going on. In fact, genetic data show that a shuttle involving amino acids that are transported in and out is also critical to sustain nitrogen fixation. How this occurs is the subject of a great deal of ongoing research. We've got all of these cells which are packed with bacteria which are fixing nitrogen. So inside these cells, we've got uh, ammonia converted, uh, uh, created from nitrogen, uh, uh, molecular nitrogen. And over here, you can see the uh, vasculature of the plant. So we, we've got, you can imagine that the stem of the root is gonna go up like this, and this, the steel, the vascular tissue in the root is gonna transport all of those amino acids up to nourish the rest of the plant. So um, I've now shown you in this first part of the overview that nodulation occurs by a very complex developmental process. It's species specific and the events that I showed you occur only if the correct rhizobium and correct plant come into combination. Now in the next segment, what I'd like to do is talk about how the bacteria and the plant uh, create signals that stimulate each other to begin their developmental process. And so in that next so slide, we're going to ask this question, how do plants and bacteria use chemical signals for recognition?